should have the power to decide issues of equality, issues of basic law, issues of gay rights, issues of women's rights, issues of uh, equality between Jews and, and Arabs. What I, I do am concerned about is giving 61 members of parliament um, the power to overrule the most basic decisions on equality. I'm not willing to assume that the court is perfect and the Knesset, that the democratically elected legislature is uh, uh, a rapacious group of, of rights violators in order to justify a system and to order to justify a system that so far has been an utter failure. Welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. This is a really important and special episode because um, we're going to talk about really the most important issue on the public agenda of Israel today, uh, which is judicial reform. And I have with me two esteemed jurists, uh, professors, uh, professors uh, Alan Dershowitz of Harvard Law School, Professor Emeritus, who I'm sure all of you know, and Professor Avi Bell from Bar Ilan Law School and from University of San Diego Law School. Both men were actually uh, joined in uh, um, a pre-indictment hearing that then Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit held for Prime Minister Netanyahu before he indicted him on uh, bribery and breach of trust charges, uh, which is now being, uh, being tried for both men argued vociferously against the indictment, uh, claiming or arguing that the uh, charges themselves that or the actions that Netanyahu was suspected of doing weren't actually crimes and specifically not bribery. Um, so they know each other well. They've worked with each other in the past. Um, so just to sort of lead into the discussion of, of judicial reform, I want to start with just a couple of data points. Um, last week, Professor Yonatan Givati from Hebrew University published a study of public faith in the Supreme Court. It was based on public opinion surveys carried out between 1991 and 2018. Um, it's, uh, they're surveys that are conducted by an international consortium called the International Social Survey Program. The same surveys are conducted in 40 different countries and they measure public faith in their court system and in other uh, government institutions, the education system, the parliament, uh, and what have you. And the, the findings, Professor Givati's findings were pretty, pretty amazing. He found that public faith in Israel, in the Supreme Court, was lower by 10% over all the other countries that were surveyed. It also found that uh, there was a disparity in the loss of public trust over those 27 years between Israel's Supreme Court and all other public governmental institutions in Israel by a gap of 24%. That is the, the, the down, downsizing or the deterioration of public faith in Israel's Supreme Court was 20% lower than the deterioration over the same period of public trust in the education system of the Knesset and of religious institutions, public religious institutions or state religious institutions in Israel. So it's pretty, pretty extraordinary. And the reason why the period that the survey was taking place during 1991 to 2018 was significant is because this was the first set of surveys that could measure the difference in public faith in the Supreme Court between the period before what's called the judicial or the constitutional revolution in Israel in the 1990s, where then Supreme Court President uh, Aaron Barak essentially uh, transformed the court into an activist court that could intervene on issues of, of abrogating laws of the Knesset for the first time and also uh, abrogating governmental policies and decisions for the first time. Um, so that it was able to measure specifically how the public was responding to that change in the court's stature and powers in Israel. Um, and the, pri the findings there are, are both stark and also of a piece with other surveys that have taken place over the past year. One in February of 2022 by Globes found that 46% of Israelis have zero uh, faith in the legal system, the courts, the state prosecution, and the Attorney General's office, 
Um, and another taken last November by University of Haifa found that 52% uh, of Israelis had low or no faith in the Supreme Court, 61% had no faith in the attorney general and 62.5% had no faith or low faith in the state prosecution. Actually, they were all low faith or no faith in those three organs of the, uh, of the uh, legal system. So I think that these numbers point to a real crisis of public faith in our legal system and a real crisis of the legal system that um, really calls out for reform. Um, so first of all, before I kind of lead into the discussion, I just want to thank you both and welcome you both to the show. Thank, hello. So hello uh, to Professor Dershowitz and hello to Professor Bell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. It's a really a pleasure to have you both on the show. And so I wanted to start the discussion with you, uh, Professor Dershowitz. Um, when you look at these numbers uh, in terms of how the Israeli public views its court, and its legal system in general. Um, what are the problems, do you think, uh, in Israel's legal system and specifically in its judiciary? And, and what do you think should be done to, to fix this situation? It's not broke and it shouldn't be fixed. It can be tampered with a little bit, but the Israeli legal system is one of the best in the world. The Israeli Supreme Court may be the single best Supreme Court in the world, and the Office of the Attorney General is one of the best in the world, certainly far better than the United States Attorney General. I'll give you an example. The United States Attorney General is a schizophrenic role. It can't be performed by one person. The role of the U.S. Attorney General is to be the Minister of Justice, that is, between 9 and 12, he has to advise the president how to get reelected. Uh, between 12 and 4, he has to pass on legislation and rules, and between four and midnight, he has to decide who to prosecute. Those three functions are divided in Israel among three different groups. The attorney generalship of the United States is an utter failure. The attorney generalship in Israel has been a great, great success. It has included some of Israel's most distinguished figures, uh, Attorney General Tzadok, Attorney General uh, Cohen, Attorney General Shamgar, Attorney General uh, Eliakim Rubinstein. Um, I met the current Attorney General today, the first woman Attorney General. The Attorney General's role is one of the great, great institutions um, in, in the legal system today. Uh, and the Attorney General is uh, selected uh, properly, not by politicians, uh, but by uh, a group of people who assure that it's uh, as nonpartisan as, as possible. As far as the Supreme Court is concerned, there are two issues. Um, one, does the Supreme Court have too much power and too much jurisdiction? And second, should there be any kind of um, uh, override by, by the Knesset? Uh, look, the public opinion numbers don't surprise me. After Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court uh, was not uh, accepted by, by a very large percentage of Americans. Uh, the Supreme Court is not a popularity uh, contest institution. Um, it's an elitist institution. It's supposed to be an elitist institution. It's not a democratic institution. Um, it's supposed to be a check and balance on uh, the democratic institutions. Uh, right from the time of Marbury versus Madison in the beginning of the 19th century in the United States, there was a great debate about how to strike the appropriate balance between counter-majoritarian elitist Supreme Court rulings and what people in a democracy uh, uh, seek. There are certain institutions that are, should be democratic. There are certain institutions that should be meritocratic. Nobody wants their surgeon to be picked by the Knesset. Nobody wants the pilot of their airplane to be picked by the uh, Knesset. You want people like that to be picked by peer review and the very, very, very best people in the world. Having said that, I think there's a horizontal and a vertical issue. I'll, go, I'll try to be brief. The horizontal issue is whether or not the Supreme Court should have jurisdiction over political and economic areas, and I think they should not. I think the Supreme Court should not have the power to decide whether or not the Lebanon gas deal is legal or not. It shouldn't have the power to decide whether the evacuation of Gaza was legal or not. It shouldn't have the power to decide whether um, dairy can become a minister, but it should have the power to decide issues of equality, issues of basic law, issues of gay rights, issues of women's rights, issues of uh, 
uh, equality between Jews and, and Arabs. And so I wouldn't mind uh, constraining the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court uh, uh, in that way. What I, I do am concerned about is giving 61 members of parliament um, the power to overrule the most basic decisions on equality, decisions that are always going to be anti-democratic and elitist. And um, I think in a democracy, there's no such thing as a pure democracy. Israel doesn't have a pure democracy. The United States with its Senate and Electoral College certainly doesn't have a pure democracy. Uh, and, and, and both countries need checks uh, on majoritarian rule. And the question is, therefore, going to always be one of degree. But uh, um, I, I wouldn't be concerned about the fact that um, many Israelis don't appreciate how good their legal institutions are. They're wrong and the legal institutions are right. Anybody who says that the attorney general, let me, let, let me just focus on that for a second. The attorney has no faith in the attorney general just is, is ignorant. And, and, and you just look at the history of the attorney generalship in Israel, and it's one of the greatest legal institutions in the history of the world. And, and, and it doesn't pass popularity contests because people don't know about what it does and how nonpartisan and neutral it is. And just one more little point. The same thing's happening in the United States today, but it's the mirror image. Um, what's happening in the United States today is that the left is trying to weaken the Supreme Court because it thinks the Supreme Court is moving toward the right. You have academics who say the Supreme Court is, is an elitist, uh, white supremacist, uh, un unwoke institution, and it should be ignored. Um, and um, and, and uh, it used to be that the concern was from the right on the left. So you're always going to get, when a, when a Supreme Court engages in judicial review, when it affects policy the way the United States Supreme Court, Roe versus Wade, uh, other cases affects policy, Israel, you're going to get a lot of disagreement with the decisions. And, and uh, that's what a check and balance on democracy means. So I would, I would have some changes. I would not, by the way, have any changes in the way in which the attorney general or justices of the Supreme Court are selected. They're much, much better than the United States method for selecting justices or selecting attorneys general. So yes, some changes, but not fundamental ones. So let me just, uh, before I hand it over to Professor Bell, I, I just wanted to do a, a follow up on a couple of the issues that you raised here. Um, I, I wasn't quite clear. Right now, the Supreme Court has no limits and no constraints on the laws that it can abrogate or the policies that it can interfere in. There's everything is justiciable, everything, everyone can petition the court, even if they have no standing in the issue at hand. Um, and so I think one of the main bones of contentions regarding the abrogations of laws and the, and the limits that I've seen on the specific policy, uh, policy proposals put forward for reform are not talking about abrogating completely or, or canceling their ability to overturn law. It's a question of limits on that power, and it's a question of the um, the inclusion of standing rules and just disability rules on the Supreme Court. So are you opposed to that as well? Or, or what limits do you think are reasonable? Because you said they should not interfere in whether uh, the gas agreement is legal or the expulsions from Gaza were legal and so on and so forth. But on issues of equality, uh, they should interfere. So how would you draw the line? What exactly is, how do you envision this taking form? Because right now we have a limitless power and what people are talking about is imposing uh, limits on that power. So checks and balances on the court itself, just as the court exercises uh, checks and balances on the government and on the Knesset. Yeah, well, part of the reforms that are being proposed today are a complete override of every Supreme Court decision by a 61-59 vote. I am categorically opposed to that. But I am in favor of the Knesset passing laws limiting the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court uh, and eliminating from the Supreme Court the power to pass on political and economic uh, cases. 
Um, I would also have no strong objection to some standing requirements and justiciability requirements. So again, uh, I, I have the vertical and horizontal argument, you know, horizontally I'm prepared to narrow um, uh, or you could go either way, or vertically or horizontally. Uh, I'm prepared to narrow the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, but on issues that they have authority, particularly core issues, basic laws, um, uh, issues that involve core human rights, I would not allow a 6159 override. You can ask me, would I allow a two thirds supermajority? We can argue about that, a four fifths supermajority, but to have any override of substantial rights of this kind, it would have to be multipartisan. It couldn't be one uh, group in the government, uh, even 64 to 56 as the current government is. It would have to be very substantial. And I would also be happy to have no overrides on the most fundamental core issues that a Supreme Court should decide. So uh, yes, I would have the Knesset limit uh, the authority of the Supreme Court over, the, over, over what subjects it can deal with but on the core subjects, I would not support an override. Um, so Professor Bell, I wanna to turn to you now. Um, can you just uh, give us a sense of, uh, well, first of all, what do you think of the idea of the Supreme Court override? And um, what do you think of the idea of placing limits on some and not others or making the override have a massive majority uh, along the lines that uh, uh, Alan, uh, Professor Dershowitz is, is discussing here. How do you look at the situation? And also, what do you think the importance of public faith in the court uh, is? Are you in agreement with Professor Dershowitz that that's immaterial? Um, well, I, I, I'm very strongly in disagreement here. And so, but I, I think that maybe the best way to attack this is to, to uh, understand that the court's powers, the attorney general's powers, have not been consistent over the years. They've changed, right? And so um, when you say something like uh, best Supreme Court in the world, best uh, attorney general in the world, um, to whom are you referring, right? If you're saying Chaim Cohen, well, Chaim Cohen would, was, uh, had a different set of powers than the current attorney general does. Right. Uh, if you're imagining him, him on the court, um, his court had a different set of powers than this cur current court does. And the, the, the powers have changed not because the legislation has changed. Um, the, the powers have changed because the court decided that they changed and they decided on the basis of nothing. All right. So um, uh, this gets us to the, the, the second part of it. You know, if you think that uh, um, the attorney general's office used to be pretty great, and I do, um, then it's at least plausible you think that it's no longer so great, um, that something has changed for the worse rather than for the better. Uh, it's hard for, to, for me to see how, how you could disregard all the changes as being immaterial. But you, you start looking at the changes and then it starts getting to be a tricky problem. How are you gonna fix this? Right? How are you gonna change things? If for example, you're, you're disturbed by the fact that, uh, um, uh, let, let's talk about the courts, uh, uh, the, the scope of the court's review of political decisions, right? Is it a wise thing for the court to pass judgment on whether so-and-so can serve as a minister? or whether so-and-so has to resign because um, uh, uh, he or she has been charged with, uh, with a crime. Right, now, it, it was very clear uh, uh, 40 and 50 years ago that of course the court had no authority to step in. Um, it was very clear that the court could not fire ministers or order them fired because criminal charges had been placed. They couldn't review the appropriateness of being appointed to be a minister. They simply didn't walk into any of those uh, decisions. But, but these days the court does. And not only does the court do, not only does the court review these kinds of decisions, it uh, slaps down attempts to regulate the court in evaluating these kinds of things. So one of the most astonishing decisions that the court reached in the last year um, was in reviewing a change to a basic law that had been made during the uh, Netanyahu Gantz government in which uh, um, uh, uh, the, the 
Knesset had adopted um, um, an amendment to a basic law permitting postponing adopting a budget for four months. Uh, and it was a political compromise that was designed to keep discussions going while uh, um, they were trying to figure out um, uh, whether to take apart the government or not. And um, the court retroactively struck down the amendment. I know it said the question was moot, but then having done that, it said the amendment was, was, um, was invalid. The amendment to a basic law was invalid, not because it violated any basic law, not because it violated equality. Right? The reason it was invalid, the court said, was it was, it was enacted with an improper purpose, and the improper purpose was political. Right? Now, if you think about this for a moment, what the court said is that it sees itself able to overturn any basic law or amendment to a basic law that it considers to be, have been motivated by politics. Now, the real threat here, the real thing to worry about is that um, 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 Alan and I will agree, let's place some limits. Let's say that the court can't step in and uh, tell Derry that he can't be a minister. It can't uh, um, um, uh, uh, order Derry to resign if tomorrow new charges are, are, uh, are filed against him, there's a real chance that the court will look at that and say, oh, well, that, that law was passed for political reasons. That's not a valid law. And in fact, you actually had uh, uh, the attorney general making noises like that <laughs> uh, today, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, describing describing the law as, uh, as personally motivated. Now, you have to have a sense of what the court's been doing over the last few years to understand what's the threat that she's making. But more or less, the threat is, I, I, the attorney general, will disregard this law. And um, if you take it to court, the court will disregard this law because it's for an improper purpose. Now, if you go through the list of all the cases that the uh, in which the court has uh, struck down legislation, you will find almost nothing having to do with uh, defending um, uh, vulnerable minorities. You'll find a few equality cases. They don't involve defending vulnerable minorities. So, for example, you, you have the court repeatedly striking, da striking down versions of uh, an exemption from the military draft for the ultra-Orthodox. Now, the the uh, 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 secular and traditional majority of the country um, may have uh, 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 a weakened political position because um, minorities are strengthened in a proportionate uh, uh, parliament, a proportionally elected parliament. But it's really hard to see how you can possibly argue that when the court strikes down this draft exemption, it's protecting a vulnerable minority. When the court strikes down um, a law that gave an amnesty to allow the Arutz Sheva uh, broadcasting station uh, to go on broadcasting, uh, what vulnerable minority was it protecting? When, when, it, when it struck down um, um, uh, Knesset legislation that allowed a private company to build and then operate a prison, what was the, what was the vulnerable uh, uh, minority? When it, when it struck down legislation that uh, required investment advisors to take an exam right, uh, um, in order to hold on to their, their license, what vulnerable minority were they were they protecting? You go through these the cases one by one. Right? They, they they increased welfare benefits for um, um, uh, um, the indigent who own car cars. They struck down welfare benefits for ultra orthodox yeshiva students. I, I, there's 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 a a, a a political explanation you can give for all these things. Um, it's very hard to come up with one that uh, um, involves defending basic rights. And I'll give you even the worst case of all, right? Uh, it's, it is a, it, the law that they struck down was an, a, a tax law. It imposed a, a tax on anyone who owned uh, three or more residential units. Right? They called it the third apartment tax. 
Now, I happen to think that it's a pretty dumb law, right? That is, uh, um, as, as a way to uh, uh, manage the market for uh, real estate to lower prices for consumers, it's a pretty dumb law. Now, th nonetheless, um, it's not really the kind of thing where we need an, an elite Supreme Court to jump in and uh, uh, render its, its verdict, but it did. And what it said was the law is unconstitutional, and it didn't say anything about basic laws, and it didn't say anything about equalities. It said that the reason the law is unconstitutional is because the debate in committee in the Knesset was insufficient for them possibly to have considered everything important about that law. Therefore, everything that happened after that committee meeting was invalid and the law was not properly passed. Now, this is what you're looking at is um, um, a system that the, the courts, the attorney general, um, their powers have expanded, inflated over the last um, uh, 40 years, slowly at first and more rapidly in recent years. And when you, what you're looking at when you look at the, the public disapproval, I don't think it's public disapproval of fundamental changes that, there, that society has to make um, that they're disturbed by. This is not Brown versus the board. This is the public perceiving the court increasingly becoming an actor in retail politics. And it's not surprising at all. When the court acts like a political actor, it gets perceived as such. I agree. Look, I, I think you've made my argument for me. Um, we agree that the kinds of cases that you just described are not properly before the Supreme Court. Virtually all of the ones you've described, I agree with, with one exception. I think private prisons does raise a question of a vulnerable minority and whether or not prison should be able to be run for profit. I think that's an arguable case, but all the rest of them I agree. So you seem to be saying that if my proposal were adopted, and that is no override on core, basic, fundamental equality issues, you wouldn't have an objection because there are very few of those cases. So, so we agree. If there are very few of those cases, let's make sure there's no override on any of those cases. That's not broken. Let's not fix it. Let's fix the part of it that's broken. So I agree with you that many of the issues that you've stated are not appropriately uh, considered by a, a Supreme Court. Now, the issue of whether or not there's sufficient uh, time during a committee to uh, have the report, those are issues that are litigated uh, in courts all over the country. But I could go either way about that. On the improper purpose, I agree with you. I don't think court should be looking into a purpose or political decisions. I think that uh, um, what you're suggesting to me is addressing the wrong side of, of the issue. So let me, I, I will answer your question, but l let me just uh, 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 flip it on you, right? Um, uh, are you agreeing <laughs> that um, it's necessary to have an effective set of reforms that will prevent the court moving off into these areas where it shouldn't be, that prevents it. Okay, so, all right. So um, the, the, cases, the cases in which you have to have serious concerns about equality, at least to date in this country, have not been constitutional cases. They've been administrative law cases. That is, they haven't been uh, um, uh, questions of Knesset legislation. They've been questions of administrative practice. And this is, you know, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a reason why. Um, and that is, it's, Israel has a uh, proportional uh, uh, democracy, which enhances the powers of minorities versus the, the, the majority. It is really, really, really difficult to pass legislation that um, uh, that uh, um, seriously compromises the rights of a of a minority. Um, it is much easier for the minority to, as a price for participating in the uh, 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 political process, force um, 
legislation in its favor. That's been much more the problem in, in, in Israel. And by the way, that's where the court has jumped in, where it's defended the, the, the majority, as it sees it, against, um, for, against a, a minority that's abused its power. So I, I think there's a reason why there hasn't been a case of any of the, the, the issues that you're considering, right? You're, you're imagining the, all these cases where there's going to be um, uh, uh, running roughshod over the, the minority by Knesset legislation. Well, it didn't happen before the court over, uh, in, in, invent, invented this power of uh, overturning laws. And I don't think that it's happened ever since. In all the dozens of cases where they've overturned laws, I don't think that any of them involved a case where um, a vulnerable mo- minority was um, was abused. And so I, I think that it's a, worth, it's a very worthwhile f- pro- issue to think, how do I protect vulnerable minorities? Um, and I, I, I'm not convinced in the Israeli system um, uh, carving out a, a superpower for the court to overturn laws is the right way to do it. Well, let me give you some some examples, obviously. Um, Among the most important Supreme Court decisions was one that basically outlawed torture. Uh, It doesn't matter whether it's an administrative agency or the military that does it or the Knesset, it's state action. And so the Supreme Court rendered a decision, a very important one that was well known throughout the world. You taught it. I taught it. Everybody taught it. Um, and, and it was a very important decision. And it was a decision that would have been written by Shamgar, it would have been written by Cohen, um, and it was written by, by Barack. There are cases involving um, um, women of the wall. It doesn't have to be vulnerable minorities. It has to be core basic rights. It can be rights of majority. It can be rights of, uh, of, of, of uh, combatants or non-combatants. Uh, Another decision would be whether you can kill a combatant while they're performing non-combatant duties. Uh, Some of the most important decisions that the Supreme Court of Israel has rendered are decisions uh, involving control over the military, all of which were very unpopular um, and would have been reversed uh, by an override of the Knesset. Um, And it would have been an invitation to the International Criminal Court to say complementarity doesn't exist anymore. But I still haven't gotten a direct answer from you. If the number of such cases you say is zero, I say they're not zero, but they're not large. If they're a small number of cases, why don't you agree with me that on those cases, there should be no override? Then we can have a debate on what qualifies as those cases and what doesn't qualify as those cases. But I don't want to see the same rules on override applied to gas leases in in, in Lebanon as applied to whether women are, are constitutionally entitled to fly airplanes in the Air Force. Uh, women are not a minority, but uh, they are a less empowered ma- a majority, perhaps. Um, that was a, those are important decisions. Gender equality, sexual orientation equality, ethnic equality, and it doesn't have to be equality. It can be limits on the military. So please, can you just answer that question directly? Yes, yes, I, yes I can. Would you agree that there should be no override on those core or, or two-thirds override or a four-fifths override on those core, basic, very few cases? I, I, as I said, I don't think those cases exist, right? And that, that, that is why... That is why that that is why I answered the way I I, I, I did, which is I don't think I, I, or let, here. Let me put it this way: There's um, um, uh, an article by uh, um, uh, an economist <laughs> named Harold Demsitz. It was called the Nirvana Fallacy. It was about antitrust policy, but I think that the the point's the same. And he said, when you're evaluating policies, you cannot uh, compare what is um, what is bad about this policy with this imagined perfect world, right? Uh, um, because real policies in the real world don't involve a choice between nirvana and imperfection. They involve choosing your form of imperfection. Now, I don't believe in, in choosing uh, the best way to protect 
um, liberal values, the best way to protect vulnerable minorities, the best way to protect basic rights consists of either um, the imperfect world of democratic politics or the nirvana of uh, a set of philosopher kings who will um, um, protect the rights perfectly and protect the minorities perfectly because they're not philosopher kings. The, the court that Israel has is a real court. The, court. the attorney general that it has is a real attorney general. That We have a record. We have a record not only before they grabbed all these powers, but also after they grabbed all these powers. And in, as far as I can see, um, before they grabbed all these powers, the system that Israel had was actually as good as or better at protecting rights than the court and attorney general have been since then. You're and the, You're saying limit the power of the Supreme Court. So you would, if you were in America, you would give the legislature of Mississippi the power to override Brown versus Board of Education because you don't think elitists should not, be making decisions no. of that kind. No, how no, we, we are not. We are not in America. Reconcile? I don't think it is. It is fair to ask me about the Nirvanas because no, this is real. I don't. This is real. So no, let, that, let me say what it, no. Then let me say what is real. What is real is what is real is the institutional environment in Israel is not the institutional environment in the United States. It, the the institutional memory is not the same. The actors are not the same. They're not playing with the I'm same. You they're not Israel playing with the same now. cards. And there's. A, Let's take Ben Gavir. Ben Gavir has made a proposal that the well, Knesset should pass a law. This is real. This is today that the Knesset should pass a law saying that the rules of combat should be different. I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that there yeah. is zero chance so, that so the Knesset will, the Knesset will pass a law saying um, different rules of engagement for Jews and Arabs. It's just okay. not going to happen. It has not happened till today. It is not going to happen. And that the it doesn't Knesset happen that in fact, an Arab group brings a lawsuit saying in practice, <laughs> the rules are different. I, and and the military doesn't stop that. What you're saying, what the, I'm saying, what I'm saying is that is what I'm saying is that I'm not willing to assume I'm not willing to assume that the court is perfect and the Knesset, that the democratically elected legislature is uh, uh, a rapacious group of, of rights violators in order to justify a system and to order to justify a system that so far has been an utter failure. Now, it's not that the Knesset is perfect. In every country is a voracious violator of rights. That's why we have courts because legislatures cannot be trusted with rights. Nor because can rights courts. Because rights are unpopular. Rights courts, are not things that people like. Free courts speech come is up with Dred Scott. Like. Due process is not something that people like. Equal protection is not something that people like. All legislatures equal protection. violate all e of those rules equal protection. all the time. Equal protection. equal protection, due process were enacted in the United States. They were enacted by supermajorities. Right. Um, Dred Scott is a decision that a court made. Plessy versus Sir Ferguson is a decision that a court made. Courts are not perfect institutions. Democratically elected institutions are not demons. But they, they overruled those decisions and courts created Brown versus Board of Education, Roe versus Wade, uh, Obermaier. Courts have done good and cases, courts have done bad. Overruling, overruling state legislatures courts which have done had good in non -equal protection. you really courts have done good and courts protection. have done bad deep down you don't like courts deep down you don't think there's a role for courts um and and you want everything to be done by the legislature what what let me ask you this question is there any one <laughs> I don't issue? believe is I don't believe that there's such a thing as 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 courts around the world I don't believe that there's such a thing as courts around the world being described in the same way. And, and if you'll excuse me, I think that this is where this is where you're mistaken, where you're mistaken is there is an Israeli experience. There is an Israeli experience of the courts. There's an Israeli experience of the, of the attorney general. There's an Israeli experience of parliamentary democracy. And give me one is, example. Can, I, of can we just? Can we just? Let me just, guys. I'm so, uh, professors, I just want to interject yeah. for a second because 
I'm going to take on the moderator role for a second just because I want to advance this. I understand that we have a fundamental difference, but that's fine. We also have a fundamental agreement, which is that there should be limitations on the court's powers, right? I mean, that I think we both agreed to. And I just want to actually move the discussion on. You know, we, uh, don't have from, we don't from, have an agreement on that. I think that Avi doesn't want to limit the power of the courts. It wants to eliminate the power of the courts. I no, want to. I, I, oh, well, court. well, let me let me just. Let me just let me just take a, as a given that he doesn't want to. I, I that he doesn't I, I, want let, to. Let me let me no, let me say more than that. Would I, you like if, to stipulate this, that you want to eliminate wait. courts, or would you like to stipulate that you think that they should be allowed to remain? I don't think. But I want I to think go that on. The, so I, I want think this that the to courts short, okay? the courts have not had under under law. No court in Israel has yet had a power to overturn legislation. If the the override clause bills a version of it passes, for the first time, the court will actually have, according to statute, the power to uh, to uh, intervene and override Knesset legislation. It'll, right. it'll be so a limited Avi, power. Now, will it, is that a I'm good thing? Yes, that's a no, good no, thing. No, 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 no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you interrupting me just for a second because I want to actually do this in a more uh, in, in a more methodical way, because what we're getting into now are specific questions of how do we want to reform? How do we not want to reform? And, um, you know, there have been no specific uh, reform offers or bills that have been put forward as of yet. We expect that there will be. In fact, that's the promise of the election of all the members of the incoming a uh, coalition government that all of them want to pass legislation that will reform various aspects of Israel's legal system, the courts, the state prosecution, and the attorney general's office. And here, before we begin, I do just want to state one thing um, out at the outset, which is that um, in Israel, all of the functions that you, Professor Dershowitz, ascribe to three different functions in the United States, in, in Israel, actually all belong to one person. The attorney general is both the legal advisor to the government, he is the head of the state prosecution, and he is also the person who's supposed to be representing the solicitor general. Uh, just, uh, just, and just, not only that, but his, his totally, legal decisions totally in Israel are binding. What? That's totally false. The Attorney General of Israel has no role in helping to get the Prime Minister reelected. No political role. Oh, no, but I wasn't talking no, 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 about that. that. I'm that talking about the... You missed my point. My tripartite oh, okay. decision please, please was the most important function of the U.S. Attorney General is to be in the cabinet and to help the president get reelected. That is not a function performed by the Attorney General of Israel. Do you admit no, that? No, it certainly is not. Okay. Good. So it is still okay. So th what? So okay. So but what I then then there was a misunderstanding. So let me just go to the specific issues. We don't have a very clear. Uh, we don't have a bill that we can debate. What we have are proposals that have been bandied about by members of the incoming coalition. The most detailed prop proposals for uh, legal reform in Israel were put forward by the by the religious Zionism party ahead of the November 1st elections. And just using that as a basis for discussion, I wanna go through some of the specific proposals. And I wanna start it with the question of the override only in the sense of what you, the two of you were beginning to discuss was the fact that currently there is no legal anchor for the, the Supreme Court's power to abrogate laws. That's, that's something that the, uh, that the that the Supreme Court seized for itself without any basis in standing law in Israel. What do you think should they should the court have the ability to do? I mean, you mentioned very clearly when you were talking about the court as an elite organization that you wouldn't want the Knesset to decide who the best doctor was. You want that to be peer reviewed. So from the court's interventions, you see that they're actually intervening in the judgment calls made by commanders in the field in the IDF. When you say that women should have the right to be a pilot, I can certainly see why you would say that on the basis of equality, but then the question becomes, uh, can women do all the functions in the army that men can do? Can they be sitting in tanks with men? Are there other issues that have to be taken into account? And does the court have the 
the professional competence to even make the decisions that they're adjudicating well, uh, in answer, many of their questions. Very simple answer to that. You defer to the Army and you say, look, if the Army makes a decision that women don't have the ability to serve in tanks or women don't have the ability to be paratroopers, if they make decisions like that based on reasonable uh, assumptions of fact, that's fine. But if they say that just because you have a vagina instead of a penis with no other factors involved, you are automatically disqualified from all activities relating to flying, the courts would appropriately strike that down and say that's unreasonable, it's a violation of equality. Although we defer to the military to fill in the blanks, we do not defer to the military on making fundamental decisions, whether or not a gay person can serve in the army alongside a straight person. Uh, you can't make that decision in a constitutional democracy, even if the legislature wants you to, the courts will and should strike that down. And I still haven't gotten a direct answer from my friend and former student, Avi, uh, who I admire and like a lot. And that is, is there any law, any inequality, anything that you would ever say, the Supreme Court has a core right to decide it and the Knesset should not be able by a 51 to 49 vote to overrule it. Segregated schools, women's equality, gay rights. Give me at least one law that you would agree there shouldn't be an override. There should be a final or relatively final decision by the Supreme Court. If you can't give me one, then what you're doing is you're saying there, there, there should be no power in the court to uh, in any way um, abrogate legislative decisions and the court is impotent in the face of, of the Knesset. So what is your actual position? It's not good enough to say there are few or no cases. We're law professors. We're allowed to use hypotheticals. And I'm asking you, give me one case where you would allow the Supreme Court to have the final say, subject to you know something like a constitutional amendment or an 80-20 or a 67-33 vote. But give me one, an one example. Uh, uh, um, it's it's interesting the way that you uh, are taking the conversation to the abstract rather than to the real, right? And so I I don't think it's a very productive thing to talk about what should be the role of a court in an abstract democracy um, with an abstract constitution, uh, and then say what's in this abstract court with the abstract constitution with an abstract democracy what should that court be able to overrule about the abstract uh, congress or abstract ben parliament Gavir is not abstract Smutridge is not abstract these that's are real absolutely people that's who are a, trying to get their way and we have to be protected against them they are they are real people so is uh, uh, Mansour Abbas so was Azmi Bishara who served in the Knesset um, so, so is uh, uh, Ilan Golan. Uh, there, there, there's uh, um, um, a, a lot of odious people that have served in the Knesset over the years. Um, I, one person does not pass a law. That's not the way the system. That's not the way the system works. That's not the way the system works. But what's more is, I think that this is this is a terrible way to decide what are the powers, the current powers of the court, or to decide what ought to be the future powers of the court. The court's powers are and should be established by law. If the court cannot be expected to obey the laws about its own powers, I certainly don't believe that they can be trusted to obey the laws about anyone else's powers. I and agree, but you're using the law in, in, as legislation. The law is broader than legislation. The law includes judicial, administrative, and actual decisions by, by people. So I agree with you. They have to obey the law, but the law isn't only enactments of when, the Knesset. Right. When if the court if the court is and this is not abstract, this is reality where the court is currently striking down legislation because it doesn't like the political motives where it strikes I'm down legislation, it know, strikes I'm, I'm down. Leg side. It I'm strikes down. Side. Yeah. So uh, uh, that's if that's what we're talking about, that's what the court is actually doing, then it, you can't even begin to describe where you want the court to to do something until you have some uh, set of 
limiting principles in law that tell you what the powers of the court are. And, I, I, and so if you agree, then I think that you, you have to agree that the, the, the fine details about what is the, 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 the override mechanism is, is so much smaller than the, the basic principle that the law, has, the law has to say, the law has to say, Courts may only interfere in this and not in that. I, I agree with And they with can you. only do so sure, for these reasons. If you were in the Knesset, would you allow a 51 to 49 uh, or a 61 to 59, whatever it is, uh, override of all judicial decisions? That's, that's real. The, that's a, okay. a real issue. The, the reality is that the, they already can. It doesn't have to be 61. I know right? I'm and that's not, No, it doesn't. Right. It doesn't. T today, if there's a decision, let's say you're talking about women pilots, okay? Um, um, there's, a, there's a decision by the Supreme Court that, that forced the, court, the, uh, uh, the army to accept women pilots, pil women into a uh, piloting course. And by the way, it, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the, the, the army said, we have no reason other than the fact that they're women. Right. They had their reasons. The court just disagreed with those reasons and overturn, over, overturned their decision. Now, the next day, if the Knesset had wanted to, it could have passed a law by two to one, giving the, the army right, two to one, not 61 to 59, two to one, giving the army back the power to exclude women. It did not. Right. It, uh, there's 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 a certain inertia to all of these things. But so all but the cases that you're talking about, you know, uh, the the the. Let's say that uh, uh, the police minister, uh, who will be Ben Gvir, um, um, imposes some uh, open fire regulation that you find unthinkable. Right? Um, what happens if the court overturns that uh, uh, open fire regulation? That can, whether any reform is passed or not, the Knesset will be able to overturn that uh, decision two to one the next day. And by yeah. the way, it won't. It won't. But, no, because... but, but, but of, of course, it, 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 as you say, it will never happen. But we're living at a time when there is a tremendous attempt to create a government. It, hopefully it won't succeed. That is illiberal in the extreme, that discriminates in favor of Jews and against Arabs, that will discriminate against gays. There is a real danger of that. Well, that's what people ran for. Ben Gavir got a lot of votes, including votes he, in. And he will be, Hebrew and he will be, he will and, be and, a minority and, in this government. Just as the right. Ill, there has Ben Gavir, together with a Smutrich, together with it's and the largest party the and the dominant. No, it is not the lo dominant the party. The dominant party in this government, as in every government in the past, is a liberal party. They have always been. Um, so and why are you I, worried? Why, I, why I don't believe, frankly. Why are you worried about not, why don't you agree with me that in the small, tiny number of hypothetical cases where maybe Ben Gavir's rule applies and the Knesset does pass a statute saying that the standards are different for Arabs than for Jews, why don't you agree with me that in that extraordinary case, at least, there can't be an override? Why don't you agree with me that in the extraordinary case in which the court acts illiberally, which, by the way, it does more often in recent years than the Knesset does, there has to be a way that the Knesset can override that? No, I, 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 in many areas, I would agree with that. If they so tried I... to overrule issues involving the gas leak, the gas lease it, in Lebanon, I would say the court, the Knesset does have a right to overrule that, but not overruling a decision well, that it, says men and women ha can be treated unequally, gays and straights can be treated unequally, Arabs and Jews can be treated unequally. Well, it happens, well, it it happen, well, it happens for well, example, yeah. one of the things that happens to be uh, well known in Israel is that there happens to be uh, uh, discrimination in giving out broadcast licenses. And it's fairly open. It's ideological and political discrimination. And um, in in the 1990s, uh, one of the things that the Knesset did in response was that it gave an amnesty to a, a, a radio station named Ahut Sheva, which was uh, right, which uh, which which was a right-wing station, which could never get a broadcast broadcast license. Uh, 
Um, but it was given amnesty to continue broadcasting. And the court struck down the, uh, the law. The court struck down the law because it said that there may be a situation at the end of time in which there, all the frequencies in Israel are used up and there will be no frequency left to give to somebody because this frequency was given to Arutsheva by, by amnesty. And that's just unthinkable, and therefore the law is unconstitutional. Now, so that's not might a liberal right about, decision. You might be right about that law. The, the point is the court has reached some terribly illiberal decisions. Right? Um, I, I think that it's... It's not. It's 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 not a, a, well, a productive way to think. Court. No, of you course would, not. That's the, exactly the point. Like exactly the no. Exact. That, that is exactly my point. The the my my point is this is a real court that engages in real decisions and putting out a parade of horribles, saying we have to give the court this these extreme powers because otherwise the Knesset will do these unimaginable horrible things uh, is the, an argument that justifies exactly the opposite. You can say, but well, we have to give the United Knesset States. extreme powers because the, otherwise the court will do these horrible, unimaginable things. That's I think exactly that the, the, what happened in the United States. The court did terrible things from the right wing point of view. So they wanted to limit their power. Then they're doing terrible things from the left wing point of view. Beware what you wish for. Ten years from now, the Israeli Supreme Court may very well turn right, and the lib the left only if the appointment be system has changed. And, and no, well, let's assume it was changed, and then the left will be seeking to limit the court, and 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 you, uh, I don't know what your position. I, be, I, I, I think that will be terrific. Be exactly the same. I don't care whether the court is conservative or liberal, left or right. I care about the institution of the Supreme Court as a way of serving as a check and balance on the democratic Knesset. That's what I care. I think That's that we can all I think that we can all agree on that. And then I and although we've gone over time, there is just one question that I still have for Professor Dershowitz. I know that uh, Professor uh, Bell probably also has strong feelings about this. But you mentioned that you didn't think that the judicial selection process should be changed. Um, but actually, the judicial selection process as it stands today ensures that what you're talking about, the pendulum swing, will actually never swing because the, the jurists have control over the appointments process. And that's also, just, there's that's no... That's not true. So I know a lot about this um, process. The process. Okay, contained. why don't you tell me why you think that this is untrue? Because let me let me just add before you answer um, what the reform the reform uh, proposal that I saw the only detailed one again was from the religious Zionism platform, and I'm sure that there are other ones as well. In fact, I know there are, but this is one that's already been published, and they were talking about maintaining the judicial selections committee in its nine member form but giving the majority in that committee to politicians, whereby four of them would come from the coalition, two would come from the opposition, and then you would have three uh, judges, one from the Supreme Court and two from the district and the magistrate courts, both of whom would be selected by the uh, attorney general. And then well, four I, nominations I say, to the I court, would... they would have public hearings, something that they don't have today, there are no public hearings in Israel for the selection of our right. of our I justices. All that. I only have another minute because I have to do my own podcast. Right, we all have. We're, we're, we're so, all quite. Um, we're all. We're all. Done, but I. I just wanted America, this one thing because yeah. I think if you're talking about limits on the court's power, and the question then becomes what, who are in the courts? A lot of these things would be settled if we had. Uh, settled on that. That those well, seem to I, me I to be larger issues. Fundamentally opposed to politicizing the appointment process. I think uh, public hearings are a disaster. They have been a disaster in the United States. They just cause perjury. Judges lie under oath about what they're going to do and what they're going to decide. Po uh, mediocre judges get appointed because of political considerations. The Israeli judiciary is so much better than the American judiciary. The Israeli judiciary process of selection is so much better than the United States. I wouldn't tamper with it, but if I did, I would probably reduce the number of Knesset members from four to two. Uh, I would push it in the opposite direction. And again, I want to ask this question. 
when the um, when the um, uh, Sheba Hospital decides on who the chief of neurosurgery should be, how many votes should the Knesset get? Um, the answer is none. It should be pure peer review. And if that means that people from the Hadassah Medical School will replicate each other and will keep appointing heads of neurosurgery that come from their own school, hey, that's a price that has to be paid. I study the Supreme Court like Avi does. The Supreme Court clearly has moved over the last 15 or 20 years slightly to the right. Uh, not to the left. Um, there have been more religious people on the Supreme Court. Um, I, I, I remember when there was really one seat for a religious person on the Supreme Court. Now, obviously, there's more. There are Arab members on the uh, Supreme Court or on other courts. And I, I just think the system of selection should be even more professional and more elitist than it is. And please don't learn from America. America will give you Clarence Thomas. It will give you justices who will swear under oath that they never heard of abortion, never thought of abortion, and that they would never overrule Roe versus Wade. Uh, it will deny great people the right to be on the courts. Um, um, and and, and it's, the American system of selection has been an absolute disaster. And I think the Israeli system uh, has not been. By the way, you left out the fact that there are bar association members, and there's no reason for the bar association members to always be left. They can be center, they can be right, um, and and you know you want to tamper, tinker with it a little bit. Have you know a few district court judges? That's okay, but I think the the system should be an elite, professional, meritocratic system, not a political system where the Knesset decides how to reward their friends by giving them lifetime appointments to the judiciary. That's what will happen if you even add one more member of the Knesset to the Judicial Selection Committee. So I'm 100% opposed to that. And and Professor Bell, do you want to respond to that? I don't, I don't want to take uh, Alan away from his podcast. I'll just uh, mention one name that I'm sure he knows her, Ruth Gabizon. Um, was uh, um, a the uh, um, I think she was the founder of the uh, uh, Israeli uh, civil Israel rights. She, yeah. she was fantastic. She's great, and she didn't and, make it. Neither did Neely Cohen, um, who was left. And you know there are reasons why. And, 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 they were quite explicit. The reasons why uh, yeah. Barack said was, about uh, about uh, um, Gabizon that the reason she was uh, she wasn't going to be allowed on the court was because she had a quote agenda, which meant she w did not go along with his activism uh, uh, push. And um, what you have uh, right now in the court is um, a court. Uh, forget about right left. Okay, what you have is a court that. Um, um, replicates um, activism that replicates its aggrandizing approach to its own power. And um, if there is no change, then um, um, what you can see looking backwards, the court now is more aggrandizing than it was 20 years ago. The court 20 years from now will be even more uh, um, uh, it will add even more to its powers than it's added so far. It's going in one direction only. It will continue going in that direction until um, there's a different way of putting judges on the court. Now, well, you um, think, about, think about my our our friend and former student Eliakim Rubinstein. I mean, Eliakim Rubinstein is a deeply orthodox person. He's a deeply conservative person, but he believes in the rule of law. He is not in the image of Aaron Barak or um, for, or or uh, or Dorit Banish. Um, there have been some who have been, uh, and and there are many who have not been. He and, is the attorney uh, general. He is the attorney general who refused to defend the 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 uh, Arut Sheva bill. I, I, on on this, he is certainly uh, an Orthodox Jew, but on in terms of uh, attorney general power and judicial power, he is absolutely with Barak. Uh, in, it may be, in fact, even further out, further out than Barack was when he started. But they come, they're totally different. And if they both agree with the rule of law, that's one thing. But uh, there were a lot rule, of dissents. It's not rule of law. A lot of dissents. I don't know opinions. what that means. It's a rule of the lawyer more than the rule of the law, though. Isn't well, it? in every system, it's going to be the rule of the person rather than the rule of the law. You know, it used to be in the old days 
that uh, judges wore wigs and uh, because you didn't want to be able to tell them apart. And uh, it used to be that you had blindfolds. People don't realize that the blindfold of justice doesn't come from Greek mythology. It comes from Parshat Shoftim, Lo, lo Takir Panim, do not recognize faces. And I think that's the essence of the rule of law is Lo Takir Panim, don't recognize faces, don't make decisions based on liberal, conservative, based on race, based, you make them based on pure equality. Don't favor the poor over the rich or the rich over the well, poor. 51% of Israelis believe that we have selective enforcement of the law in Israel. Yeah, but they're wrong. You know, the majority <laughs> isn't always right. That's why we need a Supreme Court. I have to run, but Avi, it's been a pleasure. Okay, well, I appreciate uh, it very much. We started debating how many I, years ago about some of these issues, and uh, it, it, it's been uh, a long time. And I always appreciate your columns, though I disagree with many of them. But Let's continue to have this debate. I think the debate is a healthy one and the discussion is a healthy one. And whichever way Israel comes out, I'm going to continue to defend Israel against double standards, which are always applied to Israel. So uh, I hope the right decision is made. And thank you for giving us all an opportunity to explore our differences in a friendly way. No Take problem. Care. If you have to go to your podcast, and I'll just yeah. do my closing without you, and you'll just have to wait to see what I say. Okay. Uh, I, I <laughs> know you. that it will be an excellent clothing. So thank, good. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Well, thank you as well, uh, Professor Bell. I just want to uh, make some closing remarks. So I think that what you've seen here uh, today is that the issue of judicial reform in Israel is contentious but that there are a lot of very important reasons to take the issue seriously. And, and regardless of what Professor Dershowitz said, I think that public faith in our legal system is absolutely imperative to have a properly functioning uh, governing system in Israel, because if people don't believe that the law is being adjudicated in a fair way and without prejudice, then you're going to have more and more people not wanting to abide by uh, the decisions of the courts or respect the decisions of the prosecution and the police uh, and the trust in all of those institutions is uh, very, very low today in Israel, lower than in any other country, probably in, in the free world. Um, and that's something that requires remedy. And I think that we saw a lot of agreement about the fact that you need to have limitation on the court's power to adjudicate or abrogate laws or interfere in the decisions that are being made by uh, by by uh, governments, and um, and I think that those are important uh, forces of agreement because one of the things that we're seeing in the discourse in Israel is that more and more people are um, or that the opposition to the incoming government is hysterical. And they are speaking in slogans. Some of the slogans, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to correct uh, Professor Dershowitz. Uh, Arabs, actually, in their educational system often re receive more resources than Jews do, but they certainly do not receive fewer. And, um, and that, I think, is an important thing to point out. But I think that the more that we're able to have deliberative discussions about the actual nature of the of of judicial power in Israel and what has to be done and what are reasonable uh, checks and balances on that power, uh, the more we're going to see that we have a very, very wide common denominator and that we have to demystify the conversation and just talk about the specific things that happen in reality, as Professor Bell said over and over again. And we have to talk about the specific remedies for the specific problems that we all have. And I think that the more that we do that, the easier it will be to tackle this very difficult and pressing issue in the incoming or the new Knesset and for the incoming government. So I want to thank all of you for your attention. This is a very important issue. It's very uh, hot and heated, but I think that if we can see the kind of goodwill and uh, mutual respect, <laughs> I don't know that that's possible, but in the Knesset and in our media and in our courts, haha, that we've just seen in this uh, in this debate, uh, then we'll be all right. And we should certainly try to take this uh, spirit of camaraderie forward. So thank you very much, Professor Bell, for sticking around to the end. And thank all of you for sticking around to the end. And we'll see you again soon on the next, uh, on the next show. Thank you. Thank you.